You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Good morning, and welcome to Harvest again. My name is Nate, and I'm the pastor here. And if you're new with us, we're so glad that you've come. And uh, we're going to uh, take some time to look at God's Word together this morning now. And so if you have uh, your copy of God's Word, whether it's a book or a phone, uh, whatever it may be, I encourage you to take a hold of that right now. And uh, let's open to the book of Daniel as we continue our series, uh, Building a Strong Faith in Our Trustworthy God. We have been doing this series because our theme this year is building a strong faith. In 2018, that's what we're aiming for. That's our goal, is that our faith would be strengthened beyond where it is right now. And, uh, and this series is helping us understand how do we have faith in our trustworthy God. Uh, we, today, uh, we're going to be uh, looking at Daniel chapter 3, and so turn there. And as you do, uh, can I encourage you um, to think through... Uh, a couple just practical questions. Uh, have you ever been in this situation or heard of a situation where there was a boss who came to a salesman and said, uh, we're selling this product, but we need to increase the sales, and so I want you to enhance what you're saying and lie a little bit about what this is, and if you don't do it, you'll be fired. Or maybe you've heard or know of a spouse who walked down the aisle at a church, and before all their friends and family, before God, they said, I do. And then they show up and they say, I don't love you anymore, and I found somebody else. What do you do? Maybe the phone rings, and the worst news comes. Tragedy has struck, and somebody you love, you'll never see again. How do you respond? Maybe a son or a daughter comes to you and says, Mom, Dad, I I know this is your belief system that you've raised me in, but I don't believe this anymore, and I'm going to choose something my own way, and they walk into a life of sin. There's a thousand different things in life that go well, and, and God's blessing is upon us, but when, bang, our faith comes on fire, what do we do? Today, I'm going to encourage us to stand firm in the fiery test of faith. So so I want you to get really a hold of this message, this idea that we stand firm. Uh, Why don't you just stand again right now? Real quick, stand firm. You're here. You came to church. We've worshiped God. It's been a great worship service. We've prayed in faith and dependence, and we're saying we want to stand firm in our faith. That's what we're trying to do in our message today. And everything that I'm going to tell you from here on out is going to help you if you are in one of these situations to stand firm in your faith. All right, you can sit down. The reality is that we know that we need to stand firm on our faith, but we're oftentimes tempted to manage our faith and manage the requirement to stand firm. Oftentimes, we would rather stand firm in some easy places, but when it gets hard or when we're tempted to do things our own way, we like to manage that our own way as well. And we're going to see today the importance of standing firm even then. And so as we've looked at the book of Daniel, we we know that the book of Daniel is trying to teach us kind of an overview here of Daniel is that God sovereignly protects in every situation those who loyally stand for him. Today's message is going to really drive that home even further. We started in Daniel chapter 1 where we asked the question, can I really trust God? Is he really trustworthy? And we found an answer there that was a resounding yes. Last week, we looked at Daniel chapter 2 and we saw how to actually build our faith. If we can trust him, then how is it that I strengthen that faith? How is it that I grow that faith? And today, we're going to talk about how do we actually have faith when we feel the fiery testing that God often takes us through. And so God wants to teach us something from Daniel chapter 3, and you're there already this morning, right? Uh, We're going to see, uh, again, God in story form teach us something. You know, stories are so powerful. Uh, Stories communicate so many different things. and, And so I see God teaching us through story, a real story, 
uh, really something about standing firm in a fiery test of faith. And I want to just kind of unpack Daniel chapter 3 here this morning. You know, when there's stories, there's often sections, right? There's chapters, or if you go to a drama, there's plays, there's different scenes. I see six different scenes here this morning, and I, I want to first let's spend the first part of the message. Let's get through the story, and then we'll find the principles, all right? And so here we go this morning, Daniel chapter 1, scene 1, we have a golden image, and really it's a picture of idolatry. Look at verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And so this is what happens at the very beginning. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, last time he had a dream, right? Right? And in the midst of that dream, he couldn't figure out the interpretation, and he had Daniel help him figure it out. And Daniel said, hey, you had this dream about this statue, and the head was gold, and that represents you and your kingdom. And so uh, it seems like King Nebuchadnezzar said, well, hey, if God sent a dream about a statue, and I'm the head of gold, he he says, you know what, I'm going to build a whole statue of gold representing myself. And and you guys can get a picture of what the statue looks like, because have you ever driven by the Batu Caves? Have you ever seen that statue right there? Uh, my little guy, a couple years ago, he was really little. We were driving by, and he goes, Dad, look at that st- statue of frozen butter. And uh, I was like, no, not frozen butter, but, but yeah, it's massive, isn't it? And, and that's, that statue there uh, is actually 43 meters high. The statue that, ba- that, that Nebuchadnezzar made was 30 meter high, so a little bit shorter, but you get the idea if you have a picture of that particular s- statue. It, it's, it's really setting up an idol here. On the plain of Dura, this was, uh, most scholars think this was right outside of the city of Babylon, not far away. Uh, Dura actually means a circle with walls, and it was probably a valley, valley with mountains around it. And, and archaeologists think they've even found the base of this particular statue. It's kind of hard to verify, but, but there's a massive statue base sitting on a plain just south of, uh, of where Babylon was. They think they might have actually found that. But hey, our confidence isn't in archaeology, right? What's our confidence in? The word of God. So we see here something major goes on. Verse 2, the king Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the seraphs and prefects and the governors and counselors and the treasurers and the justices and the magistrates and and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. So he's he's getting together every important official in his kingdom. And, And think about that. That would have been a major effort because it wasn't like there was an email system that they could just send out or a phone system or they actually had to send personal messengers to go get this, go get everybody and then bring them back. This was a major, major undertaking. But a king is setting up a massive statue, and, and that would have taken, it took three years to build the one at Batu Caves, right? I'm not sure, nobody knows how long this statue took to be built, but it would have taken some time, and they, they were putting some detail into the preparations because this was such an important event, and they were getting everybody who was an official in the government together, and they were all going to come together for the dedication, that's what it says in verse 2, right? This dedication of this. Now, we're going to find it's actually much more... Uh, much more uh, troublesome than just a dedication. But he assembles everybody together. Look at verse 3. Then the, all the officials, right? Uh, all the officials of the provinces gather for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that when you hear the sound of the six instruments here, horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, the whole orchestra, when the orchestra starts to play and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that the king has set up. So it's not just a dedication, is it? It's now a religious service. It's now we're going to worship this idol that the king has created. You've all been brought with great cost and great effort together, and we together are going to get on the same page because we're Babylon and this nationalistic twisting together with religion, we're going to worship this idol. He was pretty excited about it, so excited about it that it said in verse 6, look, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. Okay, so here we go. The king has said, you need to come, and you need to worship an idol, and if you don't, we're going to kill you. We're going to throw you in the furnace. What do you do? You see the crisis, right? Right? When your boss says, hey, you need to lie about this so we can get a better profit margin, what are you going to do? 
When your children say, hey, I'm going a completely different way, what are you going to do? When your friends say, we can't be friends any longer if you take that narrow, only one God view of things, and it's only Jesus. Like, you're, you're kind of a religious fanatic, and I don't want to hang out with you anymore if you keep saying that. What do you do? That's scene one. Scene two, we begin to see, I've, I've titled it, The Green-Eyed Monsters, and it's a picture of jealousy. It, that's just not all that happens in this. There, there's something else going on here as well. Look at verse seven. It says, therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So Nebuchadnezzar has gone on this massive empire expansion and he's brought people from all over the kingdoms that he's conquered and he's brought them all together and they all had different gods. And remember in chapter 1, he took the temple articles out of Jerusalem because he was like, my God's better than your God, right? And so now he has all his people, not just from Jerusalem, but all the other cities that he's conquered, and he's trying to get them unified under one religion in one particular empire. His is going to be the greatest, is what we heard last week, right? And he's like, the way we're going to do this is we're going to actually have a religious, we're going to bow down to this idol, and so everybody does. Got to think about that. Why did they do it? Why did everybody bow down? Don't be fooled. It wasn't because they believed in Nebuchadnezzar's idol. It's because they were scared of the king, right? I mean, this guy, we already know, he's crazy. He's mad. He, he's nuts. And, and, and like, you don't cross this guy, and they're like, we're afraid. And so they bowed down because it's not such a big deal, right? I can believe something in my heart, and if the outside is a little bit different, and, and, and I can live instead of die, that's okay, right? Is that okay? I mean, that's what everybody here is believing. Particularly a group of people who were pretty excited about this because they knew there were some people who were like, now we can't stand for that. And so it says in verse 8, Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. Now, you remember who the Chaldeans were, right? They, they were the ones that the king, last, last week we heard, they, they gathered all the Chaldeans together and it was like, Tell me my dream, and then it's interpretation. And they were like, well, we can tell you the interpretation because we cut sheep liver, and depending on how it falls apart, we, we can make a prediction here, right? So the sheep liver guys realize that their power isn't as powerful as God's because Daniel actually tells the dream and then the interpretation. And they're not happy about that, right? Well, what happens at work when there's a little bit of competition among employees and somebody begins to get ahead of the others? Well, it's like, tear that one down, right? Let's get him down. Let's, let's figure out a way to cause them to fall so that we can get raised up a little bit. So the sheep liver guys are completely jealous about what has happened here. And they're like, these Jewish people, like, we've got to figure out a way to get them out of here or we're going to lose our positions. They declared to the king, verse 9, O king, live forever. <laughs> Which I think Nebuchadnezzar probably in his mind is like, guys, did, didn't you read Daniel chapter 2? I don't live forever. Right? That's what we learned last week. But they're still saying it because they're scared of him. O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, and they say, this is what you did, which is like almost insulting to tell the king what he did, but they're reminding him for a purpose, right? Whoever does not fall down and worship will be cast into the fire. Remember that? Remember that? If they didn't fall down, we get to throw them in the fiery furnace. There are certain Jews, verse 12, who you've appointed over the affairs. See, there's the jealousy. <laughs> you appointed them over us, and we don't like it. So we're going to use your little decree against them so that we can get their position. The jealousy is just raging here. They're so green with envy. Certain Jews you appointed over the affairs of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Kind of a three-part accusation. We're going to cover everything here. They're not doing what you say. And they're not worshiping God. Hey, they're not on our team. They're not part of Babylon. These are Jewish guys who are standing for something different. Scene number three, the red-faced king. 
The red-faced king is a picture of insanity. I mean, this guy is mad. We see here, then Nebuchadnezzar in a furious rage. What do you think that looked like? What do you think it looks like to have an ancient Near Eastern king in a furious rage? Just picture that for a little bit. Commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, what was that like, by the way, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought before the king, and so they're being dragged into the palace? What do you think they're feeling at that moment? Well, their stomach is like, turning and twisting, right? And, and they're having a bad day, a really bad day. Like, we're going to have to give some answers here, and it's going to be, I don't know how this is going to go when we give them the real answers, right? Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you should not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? There it is. Very direct. Is it true? Is it true? Everybody bowed down, but they're saying you didn't do it. Is that true? The pressure is high. Now, if you are ready, I'm going to give you a second chance. When you hear the sound of all the music, fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning furnace. So now it's just not a public declaration and like the king wasn't joking. Now it's this private conversation and he's testing them and he's asking them and he's pointing at them and he's in a rage and he's like, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Wow. There's the challenge. There's the showdown. There's the arrogance. I'm so powerful, I'll throw you in the fiery furnace and nothing's going to save you. There's no God that can change that. You'll be dead. And since we believe in a lot of different gods, like pick what version of eternity you want to think will happen. It doesn't matter. You're dead. I'm killing you. Nothing can stop me. I'm so powerful. I'm so in control. I'm so great. The arrogance here to punish somebody for an innocent act is amazing. I mean, you remember at the end of chapter 2, the king was so blown away by what God, by what God did through the instrument of Daniel in telling Daniel what the dream was, what he dreamed, and then the interpretation that it says here that, first of all, the king fell down and he was worshiping Daniel. That's not right, but that's what he was doing because he didn't know. And then in verse 47, the, chapter 2, verse 47, the king answers to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealers of mysteries. We talked about this last week. That doesn't mean at all that he had any real belief in Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that he turned from his other gods and now was only going to worship Yahweh. And we see it play out, right? Truth and time go hand in hand. A couple years later, here he is, built this massive idol, said everybody has to worship that, and if you don't, I'm going to throw you in. And then the arrogance to say, no, God can actually stop that. I mean, this, this king's a mess. Scene four, the stare down. How would you respond if you were under that pressure? I mean, if you were hauled before the king, what would be going through your lips in response to that? Here we go, Shadrach, Meshach, verse 16, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. What? What? No, O king, live forever? I mean, this is about as far from O king, live forever that you can get. We don't have to answer. We don't have to go on trial. We're agreeing with you that we did not bow down and we will not bow down and we don't think you're actually absolutely in control the way you think you do. They go on, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Our God's able. I mean, this, this verse needs to be underlined and the next verse as well. Like if you, if you don't even normally write in your Bible, like this is like the one time you should write in your Bible. You should hit the highlight button on your phone. Like this is the verse right here that you're going to need some point, sometime in your life, you're going to need to come to this. They go on and say, but if not, if he doesn't deliver us, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. We're not doing it. Whether he saves us or not, we believe in this God. It doesn't matter. Why. Either way, whatever he chooses in his sovereignty, we're not worshiping your idol. 
because there's only one God who we worship. I mean, these guys are standing firm in their faith. These guys are, are an amazing example of what it means to stand up for what we believe in. These are the examples that we've been given. Scene four, the stare down. It's a picture of integrity. They walk into the palace. Their jaw is set. Their eyes are intense. The king asks, is it true? And he gives his little mini speech about his God and, and who's the God who can deliver you? And they say, our God who we serve is able. That's the answer to the question. And that's why we're not going to worship your God. So how's that go? Well, scene five, a fiery furnace. This is a picture of intensity. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression on his face was changed against these men. All right, so turn to your neighbor right now and do Nebuchadnezzar. All right, do the Nebuchadnezzar face. What does it, turn right now. What does it look like? Filled with fury. Look at your neighbor. Okay? His face, I mean, he's so upset. He's so angry. He's so out of control. This guy's insane. So he says, add more wood, add more fuel, more fire, max it out. Get this thing as hot as it can be. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. I don't even know that they were actually knew that it was seven times. They were just like, to the max. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fire. He's like, that's it. We're throwing them in. But I don't just need some wimpy little boy scout to do this. I need the special forces to show up because I remember this God, there's something about this God. So we're not messing around. We're taking our biggest, baddest, strongest special forces military guys, and they're the ones who are going to bind these guys up. So they bind them up in their cloaks and tunics and hats and other garments, and they were thrown in. That, such an interesting detail, right? It's like immediately. That's what the king said. Normally, when somebody got penalized and, and, and judgment in ancient, they would strip them of their clothes. They're like, we're not even taking time to strip them of their clothes. We're just going to bind them up right now in that. It's going to make the flames even better. He's so sadistic. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed the men, those really strong special forces guys, killed the men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up there. Which got me thinking about that. The special forces get toasted. Is that fair? I mean, these guys are just carrying out the order of the king that they're serving. Is that fair? That they're the ones that die? Here's the deal. If we serve a wicked king, we will be judged. You're on the wrong team. You're not on the team that's saved. And even if you're just carrying out the order of somebody who told you to do it, that's wrong. There's judgment that happens there. It's interesting, verse 23, and these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fall bound into the burnt bound. They're still tied up. That's an important detail. Bound, they fall into the burning fiery furnace. Here's scene number six. I call it the sovereignty of God. It's a picture of deity. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Hey, do a little bit of study about the King Nebuchadnezzar and all his emotions. Just in this chapter. He's so proud and arrogant and in control, and then he's mad and furious and astonished. And at the end, he's going to say some really great things about God again. I mean, this is, he's so mad. He's the mad king. He's so insane in all of this. So now he's astonished, and he rose up in haste. He was sitting on his lawn chair watching this happen, right? He's sitting, he's like, stands up. He's like, something's going on here. He's so astonished. And it says here, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. We counted them, one, two, three. We made sure they were all there. And he answered and said, but I see four. You sure you didn't throw any extra guys in? No, no, king, true. It was only three. I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. Three miracles that happened right here. Remember how I tell you in my Bible when there's a miracle, it's pink? You can look, it's pink right here, okay? Pink, use a color coding system. It helps you understand God's word, okay? When I see a miracle in the Bible, I underline it in pink. Here we go. Three miracles. The small one is they're not tied up anymore. Fascinating, that detail's included. 
the mid-sized miracle is that they're not dead. They're walking around in here, right? And when I think about them walking around in here, I mean, I think that they're walking around and they're like, our God is an awesome God, right? I mean, that's what they're doing in there. They're not just like taking a little wander around. They're like, this is awesome. We're not dead. <laughs> it's a miracle. And here's the biggest one. This is the large miracle. They're not alone. They're walking around singing, our God is an awesome God, and they get like a tap on the... Psst. <laughs> Whoa, there's four of us in here now. Now, it's interesting. It says here, this is Nebuchadnezzar's account. He says there's a fourth in there. The appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't really know who this is, and so he tried to give his best explanation about what it was, and he didn't get it right. It's something supernatural. It's something sons of the gods, and then later he says it's an angel because he can't get an understanding of what it is, but we know who it is. Actually, there's a couple different views. Some people think that it might be an angel sent by God, but most literal theologians would say it's Jesus himself. So 2,500 years ago, Jesus is in existence, right? Jesus is walking around as the fourth person. We know that, actually, it wasn't just 2,500 years ago. We know that Jesus was in the beginning, right? He was part of the creation account. Go read Colossians 1. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? The Word being Jesus. And then we understand that he wasn't just in heaven, but... But, but he actually came to earth, John 1.14 4, tells us that he actually came to earth as Jesus, fully God, but also fully man, and, and showed his glory, showed the glory of God to us. This is the Jesus that we're talking, this is the fourth person that's in there. There's other places in the Old Testament where Jesus shows up, but he's never named Jesus. Did you know that? In Genesis chapter 18, he appears to Abraham, and, and he appears in the title as Angel of the Lord. But it's really Jesus. In Joshua chapter 5, he shows up to, to, to Israel, and he's the captain of the Lord's army. There's many different opportunities, but a lot of times we think like Jesus is just that New Testament part, and what we see is like Jesus is all over the Old Testament as well because he's been in existence forever. He's God. And actively playing a part in Old Testament things like we see right here. So we need to do some, actually, we need to read the rest of the story. Here we go. Verse 25, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace and declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High. <laughs> this guy's insane. Ooh, what God's going to save you? Oh, servants of the Most High. And just back and forth. I'm so tired of his back and forth. Come out here, come out here. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. That's in pink. That's a miracle. And the Seratops, prefects, governors, and the kings and counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of these men. The hair on their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had call, call, come upon them. That's in pink in my Bible too. All miracles. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach. But so tired of him back and forth. Here he is again. He's praising God, but he has no real belief in him yet. Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel to deliver his servants, who trusted in him. We're learning how to trust God like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any other god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses will be ruined, and there's no other god. <laughs> He's like, I mean, it's kind of cool, but it's just like, you're such an idiot. I'm going to hurt you if you don't worship their god now. Back and forth, back and forth. He's just out of control. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the province of Babylon. Hey, we're trying to grow in our faith. We're trying to build a strong faith. And one of the verses that we've been memorizing, I've encouraged you to memorize is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 9. Do you know that verse yet? It says, if you are not what? Firm in the faith, you are not firm at all. And what we're seeing here is, there, there is an incredible intensity to the story of, at the very end, Nebuchadnezzar saying about these guys, they trusted in him, and they didn't set aside their beliefs. They didn't compromise. And what we're finding here is they were firm in their faith. And we're learning today what it means 
to go through some difficult moments and still have faith. And so some principles to help us here stand firm in our faith. Let's start with this. I have five of them, so write this down in your notes if you have. Number one is this. If your faith is real, and it's not always real, not everybody who says they have faith actually has faith. That's what we're going to find. But if your faith is real, your future is certain conflict. Like, Pastor, that's not what I wanted to hear at church today. You're supposed to be that smiley preacher who just gives me lots of warm things I can walk away from, right? And listen, sometimes yes, and there is comfort even in this story, but we have to do some reality first. And the reality is, If your faith is real, your future will have certain conflict. There's a trio of men here with real faith. They're not cultural Christians. They're not being pressured out of what they believe to conform to something else. And they're doing it in the most hostile culture you can imagine. They're refusing before the king. In his face, they're refusing to do what... Listen, they're not doing the Asian thing where you say yes, but you really don't do it. Like, they they just took the chance and said no on the front end. And it results in certain conflict. It results in war. You need to know, I was talking a little bit about this with my family this week, or we had a discussion. Psalm 119 says, Oh Lord, I am a stranger on the earth. If your faith is real, you don't fit in in this world. You're a stranger on this earth. You have to wrestle down the reality that I want to have faith in Jesus. I believe he's the only way, but that means that there's going to be times where I'm at odds with everybody else in the room. I'm going to be the only person that raises my hand and says, I want to do it God's way. You also need to know that the promise of Scripture, Paul writes and says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Did anybody tell you that when you came to Christ? If you do things God's way, there's going to be some resistance to that, is what that verse is saying. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to be at that, like, deny him or die. It doesn't mean that's always going to happen, right? But it means there's going to be some tension in the room. 1 Peter chapter 4, write this down. 1 Peter, such a helpful verse. 1 Peter chapter 4, let me read it to you, and then you can look at it later. Here's some comfort in the reality of the conflict we're going to have. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so many times I'm like, I, I want the Spirit of God to rest upon me. I want to do things His way, but I don't want to be insulted for it. And at times, our faith might be weak enough where we, like, we just don't even stand up for it. The reality is we're going to be reviled and persecuted. And 1 Peter 4 is even telling us that that's probably proof of really knowing God. Now in this, let me just caution you. Don't be persecuted because you're a jerk. Don't be persecuted because you're just arrogant and you just don't actually relate to anybody well. Sometimes we use religious things and we're like, wow, I'm just standing for my faith and we're just, we're just being a jerk about it. Like, that's not what it's saying here. Be rejected for what you stand for, not how you go about doing it. We're told to rejoice, and the reason we're told to rejoice in 1 Peter 4 is because in 2 Corinthians 2, it tells us that for all those who have received Christ, we have this fragrance, we have this aroma. It says that we have the aroma of life to those who are being saved. That's partly why you like being here at church today, most of you, right? Did you like coming to church? Who liked coming to church today? Okay, do you know why? Let me remind you, okay? Turn to the person next to you. Go ahead, turn right now. And sniff. (laughs) 
You like being together because there's an aroma of life. Like we're believing in Jesus Christ and we're encouraged by that. And that's such a good smell. I want more of that, so I'm coming to the church next week, right? And so for those who are being saved, we have this aroma of life. But then it goes on and tells us, but for those, but it's the aroma of death to those who are perishing. I mean, it's possible that you're here today and you were forced to come and you hate it. And you're like, this is so boring. There's nothing boring about this. Why do they get so excited about those songs? And why, you know, they prayed for, for, for too long. I lost my concentration. And, and, and it's like, like, it's the aroma of death. You're like, I don't like being around people who are saved. Because I'm not. I don't even believe in all this stuff yet. Now, here's the thing. We're so thrilled you're here. And we're not trying to be jerks about this. The aroma shouldn't be like, you smell terrible because you're a jerk, but because like I'm still battling with, is this Jesus thing real or not? And we want you to continue. Listen, it's the aroma of life. As you come to a better understanding of who God is and who Jesus is, it becomes sweeter and sweeter smelling to you. Hang on to something that might be like, man, I don't like the smell of that. Hang on, it gets better. As you believe these things, it becomes the aroma of life, and you love to be with God's people. Just, just take the time to bear that out, right? And so we see here that the word we're talking about here is conflict. If I have a real faith, there is a certainty of conflict that's coming. Now, things were going well for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were promoted, and then when they were re-promoted, they had the best food, they had a roof over their head, they had positions, it was going so well. And you might be saying, you know what, they, they believe in God because He's giving them His blessing. Well, we're going to find out that it's real, not because they experience blessing, but because of the conflict, right? And so write this down, number two here, when life gets turned upside down, your insides come outside. Now, don't think too hard on that. That gets a little bit graphic. But what I am trying to say is the reality of your spiritual life, because listen, we can't, know, we can't know the heart of the person next to us. We can see evidence and fruit, and, but sometimes that's fake fruit, right? And, and so how do we know if, there's actually sa- if I'm actually really saved? And the reality is that we find out where people are spiritually, not when things are going well, but when things get bad. Anyone can trust Christ when things are going well, but when you get your life turned upside down, when you're in the ditch turned upside down and times are tough and the seasons of trial come, I very much see that happen, by the way, seasons of trial. There's seasons where it's just awesome to follow God and there's seasons where it's really hard. And and, and I think that's encouraging because you have to recognize it's a season. It's not forever. There's moments where it's harder than other times. There's moments where it's great and it's wonderful and it's easy. And there's moments where it's really hard. And it's when it's really hard that we find out what's on the inside. I mean, think about what these guys went through. Could you handle, could you handle threats of physical harm to you for believing what you do? Like on the way in today, if there's somebody standing out there with a whip and they said, if you go in there and you worship, when you come out, we're beating you up. Would you still go in? I mean, if you came and you were like, anybody who preaches the gospel, like we're throwing them in prison. Like I'm not coming to that evangelism training thing, right? I mean, if you were at that moment of deny or die, what would you do? It really begins to define who actually believes. See, I see three types of people here today. For some of you, you've never committed your life to Christ and you're trying to figure this out and this message is intended to help you understand the totality of what God is calling to you to and the magnitude of how great it is that you are being called to as well. But there's some here today and you're professing followers of Jesus Christ that on the outside you say you're a Christian and you even do Christian things, but on the inside it's not true. So I have a friend who one of his jobs is to go around and to, to check out and find out what products are being sold in stores that are genuine and find out who are selling fake things. And, and there's some things in particular, exported things, that get like a special export label and then they get to charge more for that. And, and so his job is to go around and find out what's fake and what's real because on the outside, the label, like the, the really good ones, 
they get the correct label that says it's an authentic, exported, imported into this country thing. But when you actually go and you find what the contents of the box or bottle or whatever it happens to be, it's not for real because the inside isn't real, but the outside, man, it looks so good on the outside, right? So and China, I went to Chinatown this week because I needed a new pair of sunglasses. And uh, I, I'm not willing to pay hundreds of dollars for sunglasses. I think that's stupid because I sit on them like every week. And uh, so that's a waste of money for me. But Chinatown sunglasses are awesome because they look, right? They look like the real thing. But I paid a tenth of the price of what you paid for your designer sunglasses, right? And, and the same thing happens when the test and trial comes we find out what the real thing is. And there are many of you here who I think are the real thing. I'm not even accusing anybody of being the fake thing. I'm just saying that when the difficult things come, you're either going to compromise and demonstrate that what you had isn't real, or you're going to actually be tested by that. You're going to be willing to go into the fire for the Lord, and you're going to see the reality of, I have a real faith. Because when you're tested, what's inside comes outside. Here's number three. God is testing your faith. He is testing your faith. And he wants to know, will you believe in him either way? I mean, this is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, right? If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that we have set up. I mean, this is really a high water mark in Scripture, what these guys say. They say that no matter what, we believe, and it's up to God and His sovereignty, it's His providence whether or not He wants to take us out of this world, but our faith isn't based on how well we feel treated by God. That's a worldly faith. That's a faith that demands that's a faith not in the person of God, but in the figment of your imagination that says, if God does this for me, I'll trust Him. Or as long as He doesn't do those things, I'll trust Him. Really what happens is it puts you in the position of God. You're not believing in God at that point. You are saying, I'm God, and, and whatever this God is, if it serves me because I'm at the top of the tower, I'm the one in charge, that's the God who will serve me. And what we see from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they have faith that trusts in God either way, right? God is able to save us, but if He doesn't, we still believe we're not worshiping your stupid idol. And in that, they're saying He can do it, but it's up to Him, not up to me. That's a faith that's completely abandoned to the object of our faith, to Jesus Christ. What we see here is their obedience was not dependent on God doing what they wanted. How many times do we worship God because of something we expected Him to do and then He did it? That's a scary place to be, really. I mean, what if God doesn't heal your marriage or help you conceive a child? Or do the career thing that you want? Or, what if God lets something happen that you don't want to happen? What if you have a broken heart? Or a child that walks away from faith? Or you develop a terminal illness? Scripture tells us don't put God to the test. And the key here is that God is in the process of refining and proving and testing the faith of those who really know Him. And He wants you to come to a place of surrender that says, either way, God, I'm going to ask you for something in this. I'm going to ask you to change this, but either way you want to do it, I'm going to worship you. That's the kind of faith that's being modeled and that we're being called to. Here's number four. This is kind of the main one right here. Stand for Jesus and Jesus will stand for you. Stand for Jesus and Jesus will stand for you. I just want to tell you a story that comes from Acts chapter 7. We studied Acts a little while back and, and we understand the story of Stephen there, right? You know the story of Stephen? 
he goes before all the guys who murdered Jesus. And he says, Jesus is God. I fully believe him and you should too. And they get so mad that they're gnashing at the teeth, right? And they, they take him and they take him out and they begin to stone him. Now, when you stone somebody, it's not like a quick, easy death. It's not like done, right? You stone somebody, first you maim them and then you kill them. And there's a process to that. And I hate to describe that to you, except for the fact of what happened during the maiming in the story in Acts chapter 7. We see here in Acts 7 that Jesus, Stephen sees a vision of Jesus, right? He looks into heaven. And do you know what it says there that he sees? He sees who? And what posture is Jesus in? He sees Jesus standing. Now that's an important detail. Because all throughout the New Testament, we see that Jesus is sitting He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Over and over and over, when we see Jesus' position in heaven, He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, except in this story, we see that He stands. And what is He standing up for? He's taking a stand for Stephen, who's standing for Him. What we see here is that Jesus will support you in any situation that requires you to stand for Him. And the intimacy that we see here is that as we suffer with Christ because we don't compromise, Jesus is with you. It's one of the things that I got to thinking about with this particular story. (laughs) Thinking about this, God knew he was going to deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Do you believe in God's sovereignty? Do you believe that he knows the future? All the events and all the details? He does. He knew he was going to rescue Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So something was really bugging me this week. Why didn't God just deliver them way earlier in the story? I mean, if I was in control, if I was the one that was thinking about it, these were the people who were my children. I mean, mean, he could have just split the palace in two right there and said, I'm God. I mean, he showed up in the furnace. Could he not have just showed up to the crowd and said, you're bowing to the wrong thing? Could he have not just convinced hearts at that moment, the king go, is it true you didn't stand? And then change his heart and be like, actually, you did the right thing. We did the wrong thing. And the insane king could actually find his mind about the, I mean, God could have done so many different things here, but he didn't. Imagine how hard it was for them. The horror of being tied up and bound. What was going through their minds as they were walking, being dragged to the furnace? I mean, that's a lot of suffering for someone that God knows He's going to deliver. Thinking about this and seeing really what the story says, two things, two reasons are given. Number one is the impact on the observers is greater. We see here that the story, all all the prefects, all the governors, all the officials, they saw that the fire didn't have any power And God was glorified in a way that probably would not have happened if he did not take them through the fire. God gets greater glory. Here's number two. There's some things that you can only learn from being in the fire. I mean, you can, I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday. Man, I would way rather learn the theory of what it is to know God wholeheartedly But the practical thing that I find I often know comes when I go through something deep and dark and difficult. And so not only is God glorified, but there's something that I can learn only by God taking me through this. And so I think it's so significant that we see that it's Jesus in the furnace Jesus fulfilling his promise, I will be with you. My purposes will be accomplished and I will take care of you in it. And these guys, listen, they already knew. They said, either way, either way, we're, gonna, we're not going to worship. We'll take, we've counted the cost, we'll take the consequence. And Jesus is like, I'm going to be with them in the midst of that. Because God is more greatly glorified and these three guys are going to have a way stronger faith and actually recorded in history, now we all have a stronger faith because of what we heard from them, right? 
So in this, recognize that God's delay is not a lack of love. It's not a lack of love. He cares greatly for the, di- for the difficulty you're going through. And in it, he's trying to show you this is worth it. To complete, completely sold out, to be completely bought in, it's worth it. Having faith in Jesus Christ is worth more than the great pearl of, of the pearl of great price. It's worth more than any treasure you could find in any other place. What we're finding here is that having Jesus is superior to any other thing that you could have or lose because you stand up for Him. And when you get convinced about that, we can stand for Christ. Now, one last principle that I want to say here this morning. Write this down, number five. Give it all no matter what. Faith means I'm going to give everything no matter what. There's not going to be anything halfway. It's going to be all of me. And this is what is so hard because we hate to hear this. People hate to hear the totality and the completeness and the sold out nature of the requirement of following Jesus Christ. It's too narrow. I want it both ways. I want to be able to do some things that are wrong and still say I love God. I want to love God and save my skin. You're like, man, like hit the doors. We're out of here. I don't want to be at a church that teaches. I want to be at something that teaches me something comfortable and and that no matter how I live, I'm going to get there because God just loves me. And you're not going to hear that message here because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we would stand firm even if it cost us everything. And these guys were completely sold out. There's so many reasons they could have compromised, but they remembered what they were taught and that later we were, were, was recorded for us. Let me remind you of a couple of things. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's what John wrote. He's saying, give it all. It says, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that person think that he will receive anything from the Lord. Give it all. No man can serve two masters. Either he will love one and hate the other, or he'll hate the one and cling to the other. Jesus said, if you confess me before men and take a stand for me, I will confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. The bar is set so high. And we're going to struggle and be tempted to compromise. But the call of a faith that's being tested is to stand firm. My college roommate in 1997 went to the country of Jamaica, to Kingston, Jamaica, to one of the worst parts of that particular city. Poverty reigned, and in particular, gangs roamed the streets. In that, they were doing outdoor evangelism, and one of the evenings that they were there, they had worked all day on a building, and they were tired, and they came, and they were, they were standing out in the street corner with a guitar, singing songs, trying to gather a crowd so that the gospel could be preached, and before the gospel could be preached, suddenly down the street, gunfire rings out, rings out. and here's these 15 college students standing there with one, one Jamaican believer, not a pastor, not, a, not an anybody, just somebody who lived in that neighborhood who was poor, in the midst of poverty, trying to eke out a life and found Jesus. And as the gunshots begin to ring out, he stands up and he says, stand firm, stand, everybody stand firm where you are. Something more important is coming, stand firm. And everybody scatters. But my roommate was marked by that particular instance for life. And as he told me the story, I was forever marked by it as well. That there's something more valuable, there's something more important that has to be done, that we would stand in a hail of gunfire and say, stand firm. Because Christ is worth it. Because you have to know about it. Because even if we're being tested and it might kill us, we have to demonstrate the pearl of great price is worth everything we have. 
I'm going to pray and ask God to teach that to us, and then we're going to do two activities to help us with this today. We're going to have an opportunity to stand physically, and we're going to have an opportunity to stand symbolically through the Lord's table. Thank you.